Good evening. Hello, my name is Joan Concannon and I'm the director of the York Festival of Ideas. In normal circumstances, we've been intending to launch our 10th anniversary festival under the banner theme of Infinite Horizons. But of course, the impact of <laughs> COVID-19 crisis means we'll have to postpone seeing our fantastic and loyal festival audiences in person until next year. Over the past few weeks, we've become sharply and profoundly aware that the margins of how our society functions safely are far more precarious than many of us had ever dreamed of. The scale and speed of change has been awesome in the true sense of that word and deeply shocking. For those of us lucky enough to be able to work from home, our worlds have narrowed to the scale of a laptop screen. For those of you working in frontline services, the rest of us can only gasp in awe at your bravery and resilience and attempt to show our appreciation inadequately by clapping. And for many more whose lives were blighted and have been blighted by inequality, by poverty, by racism and social isolation, the world has become even more alienating. And so we've been working with partners to create a virtual festival programme. We hope in just a small way to offer some solace, some entertainment, some stimulation and perhaps even some inspiration. The University of York created the Festival of Ideas and our mission is to educate, entertain and inspire diverse audiences of all ages and experiences by delivering fantastic events for free. That remains our core mission and exists in perfect harmony with the University of York's passionate belief that universities exist for public good. We are hugely grateful to all of the programme participants and tonight's speakers for agreeing so swiftly to join us in this new virtual world so that we can together explore and celebrate a globally connected world of ideas and knowledge. Because now more than ever, human beings need to be able to communicate with each other, to understand and respect each other's differences. If we're not only to get through this pandemic, but perhaps to try to make the world a better place after it. We welcome everyone in our community, our staff, our students, our prospective students, our friends and neighbours across York and further afield, our global alumni community in 180 countries, our generous festival donors and all of our festival um, partners, and of course you, our audience. We invite you to dive into our virtual program of more than 60 free events taking place until the 14th of June on a theme of virtual horizons. And so I'm delighted to be working with Make It York this evening to bring our opening event to you, focused on our own community here in York, a place I am so proud to call home. We want to explore how we can work together to recover from this awful pandemic and to do so recognizing the potential for and power of collaboration with colleagues from around the world. So please allow me to introduce the fabulously wonderful Greg Dyke, Chair of Make It York, to take us through the rest of this evening's exploration of York in a post-COVID and interconnected world. Thank you, Greg. Thank you, Joan, and uh, good evening to all of you watching and welcome to this, the opening session of the York Festival of Ideas. This session has been made, has been produced jointly by the festival and Make It York, and I'm told that some 750 people have applied for tickets. I've made television programmes with smaller audiences than that. Welcome to you all. As Joan has told you, I'm Greg Dyke and I'm chairing tonight's discussion. I am a former student at the University of York a long time ago and was for 11 years the university's chancellor. I'm currently the chair of Make It York, the city's business development and destination marketing organization. It's a job I only started in January and things um, started well. In my first month, we learned that the House of Lords might uh, move to the city. And in the third, that the government had committed to help fund the infrastructure of York Central. So far, so good. And then, of course, disaster struck. By the end of the fourth month, there was hardly a, hardly a tourist left in the city and dozens of businesses were closed due to COVID-19. An interesting first four months in a new role. Of course, over the past couple of months, we've all learned a few things. I mean, we've all learned a new verb, 
to furlough, and many people we all know have actually been furloughed. We've all learned about social distancing, and I learned only last week that to make sure that all their passengers were at least two meters apart, it meant that LNER could only use one in every six seats on a train. Little wonder the train companies have temporarily gone back into public ownership. And finally, on the telly, we've seen the inside of hundreds of people's homes. And what we've realized is that when they are in the privacy of their own home, most men tend to dress just like Dominic Cummings. The only difference, of course, is that he does it in public. To the point, uh, tonight's the first night in 12 weeks that I've actually worn a proper shirt. Our subject matter today couldn't be more important. As you know, the session is entitled Road, Roadmap to Recovery, York in a Post-Covid World. And our aim is both to try to understand the seriousness of the situation York currently faces and to discuss how the city and the surrounding region can not only recover from COVID-19, but can actually take advantage of the current crisis as we go forward. What I plan for this event is for me to do a short introduction, and I should warn you, the economic predictions are, um, they're not pretty. And then one by one, I will introduce our five speakers. At the end of his or her speech, I will ask each of them a single question. And hopefully, after all five have spoken, we will open it up to you. Hopefully, we will have about half an hour for questions, which we will run in the style of question time. So, how do you submit questions? Well, if you're watching live, you can ask questions using the Q&A button on your screen. This is available throughout the talk, so questions can be asked at any time. Should you have any technical issues, such as a loss of Wi-Fi, you can rejoin the event using the original link. Please also remember that today's event is being recorded, so you will be able to watch it again if you want. The whole session will end with Keith, Keith Aspden, the leader of the City of York Council, who will have the unenviable task of trying to sum up, but he's also got to outline the council's approach going forward. And let's be honest, there are no magic wands in these circumstances, and he's got a tough job in these circumstances. So to start, regionally, the most frightening statistics I've seen in the last week or so come from the York and North Yorkshire Local Enterprise Partnership, the LEP. They're one of 38 such partnerships around England. Using numbers from the Office for Budget Responsibility, they have produced a model for our region post COVID-19, which suggests that York itself could lose a total of 17,500 jobs, of which more than half are in tourism or retail, leading to an unemployment rate in the city of nearly 18%. The LEP model also predicts that the wider region of North Yorkshire, including York, could lose a total of 69,000 jobs and have an unemployment rate of 18.9%, which is slightly higher than that of the city itself. These figures are, of course, like all economic forecasts, based on a myriad of assumptions. However, if they turn out to be true, they are pretty depressing. At the same time, City UK, a financial lobby group, came out with the prediction that, a, that small to medium-sized businesses in Britain, and as we know, there are many of those in York, will come out of the crisis with £105 billion more debt than they had before COVID-9 started. And yesterday we learned that the banks have warned the government that they believe many of these businesses will not be able to repay all of this debt. So that's the scale of the problem we could be facing in the very near future, which means, of course, that many families in the region could be struggling 
as well as many businesses, of which a fair number, if this is true, could go bust. Now, I'm a natural optimist, and I don't think it will turn out to be quite as bad as that. I suspect that these numbers are the LEP's worst case, and looking forward, the LEP also suggests some sort of recovery could come quite quickly. It assumes that economically we are currently in the worst quarter of 2020, quarter two, and that things will get better in quarter three and could even return to normal by quarter four in many industrial sectors, but not in tourism and related industries where recovery is likely to take longer. So while the future currently looks difficult, we should say not all is doom and gloom. And remember, this is York a city with a long history and tradition of reinventing itself at difficult times. It is also a city rich in knowledge, cutting edge science and technology, and increasingly digital creativity. So to our first speaker, Giuliani Delaney is the CEO of the York-based Continuum Attraction Group, which runs a series of attractions around Britain including ITV's set and studio tours, Edinburgh's Mary King's Close on the Royal Mile, Portsmouth's iconic 35 million Spinnaker Tower, and the Royal Mint Experience in South Wales. She currently employs a total of 400 people, and believe it or not, 388 of those are currently furloughed. She believes that although the attraction industry has currently been decimated, it can recover, particularly here in York, a city she, believe, she believes has a series of natural advantages over its competitors. Juliana, over to you. Thank you, Greg. Crikey. Um, tourism, hospitality decimated. I'm still here. I'm still positive. So uh, thank you very much indeed for inviting me onto this uh, session. Welcome indeed to a festival idea of ideas in a time of a global pandemic. It sounds pretty crazy, doesn't it? But no, actually, um, I think it's a great time to be, a create to be creative. It's a great time to take up a challenge. I've got a Chinese proverb. I wish it was a Yorkshire one, but it isn't. It's a Chinese proverb on my office wall. Um, that I left weeks ago that says everything is hard before it is easy. So our topic this evening is what does York's roadmap to recovery look like post COVID? Well, firstly, I have to declare that I have a real problem um, with the word recovery. I have an even greater problem with that phrase that's being used new normal. Both recovery and new normal suggest to me a return to where we were before, the same as, and that's just not acceptable. For a great city like this, a great city like York, we can't be that complacent, we can't be that lazy. Instead, I'd like to use this platform to say that we should focus on a different mantra. We should focus on build back better. So I'm going to spend a bit of time talking about my approach within the company, Continuum. Uh, but I'd like to just look back first at the lessons that York's history teaches us. I spent my career um, uh, marketing heritage attractions, and I'm very um, aware that history always does teach us lessons. And York certainly teaches us that uh, you can approach a crisis in a number of different ways. I'm not the historian, so um, I have checked the facts, but um, I'll pick it up if anybody says they're wrong. When the Romans arrived at the gate of our settlement, they took over. They shook it all up and they left the place behind them in a way that had changed irreparably. But we see that great legacy of their invasion or their conquering even now around us from the walls to the city layout, to the minster, to the flow of the rivers. When either the boneless, we think COVID-19 is a problem, when either the boneless arrived in 866, again, the city as it was faced a crisis and was changed forever. 
from our place names to our DNA. But the positive signs of that Viking invasion are still plain to see. Interestingly, both crises changed the name of the city. Is there a lesson there for us to learn on our road forward? From the arrival of railways to the confectionery manufacturing to the invasion of tourists in the 70s onwards, crises have always challenged York, but York has always found a way forward. So the lesson that history teaches us is out of the worst of situations can come good if you embrace that change. And each time York has emerged stronger, more strategically positioned, and as ever, unique. I was looking up what the meaning of York was, uh, or where York, its current name, uh, comes from. And it's old Welsh or Irish. The Welsh and the Irish are always in there somewhere. And it's actually the place of yew trees. And in a hopeful moment in my shed last night, I looked up what yew trees are famous for or synonymous with. And actually, it's longevity and renewal. So we're going to keep that in mind. Well, how has my company faced this crisis? Um, as Greg said, from viewing towers on the south coast uh, to underground attractions on the Royal Mile uh, via York's Chocolate Story in King Square, we've gone from a £15 million turnover business to zero. From 400 plus employees to 14. And we've had no income whatsoever for 72 days and counting. But my great team, first of all, we went through the react, the respond and the consolidate phases. And then we started to plan. And we recognized that we could not go back to business as usual. We've recognized that there's a value in the gift that we've been given of time. Time to think, not just work on a business. We found that the most surprising asset that we as a business have is our local community. We've realized that the word, what the meaning of the word social is in social um, media, what it actually means, social. And we've also recognized that our business model has to change and we have to shoot instead for the moon. So how are we going to respond to this? How are we going to take the opportunity out of the crisis? Well, um, we're going to look for some real change, not just recovery and not just that new normal. We're going to work differently from here on. Uh, we're going to be smarter. And you've heard these terms before, but it's true. We talk about it, but now we're going to do it. We're going to be smarter. We're going to be leaner. We're going to be fresher. We're going to engage with our guests and our team on a more user, with more user-led technolog technology. We're going to change our visitor offer to be something that's more purposeful as well as engaging. And we're going to look to change our business model. One that is more 24 seven, because a business that makes 80% of its profit in 40 to 50% of the year, i.e. tourism, is not necessarily a good model going forward. And we're going to strengthen our brand positioning. We're gonna to look to demonstrate our clarity of purpose. And I'm, I'm using that word a lot, purpose. And our green credentials and our hyper local appeal. And from a position this time of real intent and not just as a tick box exercise that many companies have used in the past. So everything supports the idea that not only can my, my company um, look to change our position in the marketplace and build back better, but York can too. It's done it before. But what York needs to do now is to reevaluate what it stands for. It needs to find that unique point of difference and be in no doubt from Barcelona to Beirut, those same conversations will be taking place about how do we restart our tourism industry and our market again. We've got to look at what we're strong in and how we can play those cards. Could it be the very people of York, Yorkshire, 
York. They're unique. Can it be a green agenda that we've talked about, but we haven't really delivered? And I reference the civic trust um, proposal uh, that's been launched, which is to cut uh, cars, cut out cars for good. Uh, that, that's shorthand and it's a much longer document, but it's delivering that green agenda. And can we at last take the river to our heart in the city? So I suggest that York doesn't have, and please forgive me for those who are listening from the public sector, but that we don't have a public sector led road map to recovery. But we use this crisis in York to find our Elon Musk amongst us, to find somebody who can help us to plan a shot at Mars and just instead of just the same. Because what better way of getting our act together than to use this festival of ideas in this global pandemic to find a real position for York? Thank you. Thank you. Um, Tom, what does your shot at Mars mean? It's going to be cheaper than Elon Musk's um, shot at Mars. Um, we had this conversation, I think, before, um, Greg, when you asked me what I thought that the good ideas for York uh, were. And I brought out something that I've been keeping on my desk, which is a slightly upside down um, uh, crystal um, glass, but I'm kind of using it as my crystal ball at the moment. And guess what? I alone can't see what that shot at Mars is. But what I'm saying is that a festival of ideas should be looking to find what our great ambition for this city could be. Right, thank you, Juliana. Our next speaker is Zina Youngestead, a leading thinker in international tourism, who was at the forefront of a major transformation in the approach to tourism in Copenhagen. She is now CEO of Group Now. She believes this crisis is an opportunity to change and expand York's tourist industry. Over to you, Zina. Thank you very much, Greg. Uh, yeah, so um, I think for me, also working in tourism and formerly from a destination perspective, of course, the first part of this crisis was what it is, a crisis. And we were all completely blown away by the disruption of Corona and, and what that meant and how much it changed for us immediately. And I think one of the first major signs of this disruption that we all saw was destinations going out and actually asking people to stay away. And at first, within the destination community, you could see reactions against this, um, saying, oh, let's not overreact. But quite quickly, that reaction actually became um, more of a sign of the fact that they, you know, a credibility and that they were taking it serious, that they have the best, the best um, interest at heart of both locals and visitors. And I think in many ways throughout this crisis, we've seen our destinations and our cities in new ways, in very different ways, for better and for worse. Um, I call it the crow narrative. It's, it's, it's become a new narrative of our communities and our societies. And some of it's been horrible pictures of this crisis and the impact it's had on many lives. Some of it has been encouraging, heartwarming pictures of people clapping health workers or singing from balconies. Um, and I think some of it's also been in completely new ways or through new channels with a boom in technology. Um, so from the crisis, when and. I admit we were as well in, in ultimate uh, crisis mode in the first couple of weeks thinking what, what's going to happen now, everything that we've talked about for years and years is completely uh, bombed back. Um, but, but I do think that, that some sort of energy arose from the crisis and that's why I'm going back a little bit to when we were all thinking very much about this. But now it's slowly changing somewhat. Uh, and we're starting again to, um, to at least dare to think about traveling. Some countries are opening up. We're talking about travel bubbles between different countries. And we do see new initiatives, new measures being introduced to allow this new open traveling again. And some of those measures are, of course, uh, regarding safety and hygiene. And it's not 
only as a what you call prerequisite or demand it's also increasingly offered as a service so i think it's quite interesting now to see how the airlines are adapting to this some airlines are coming out with rules saying well you have to wear a mask when you're flying and you bring your own mask but you also have airlines saying yes you have to wear a mask when you're flying and we're offering this um travel hygiene kit for all our travelers so i think that's a different approach to it and you also see massive innovation happening so you have restaurants i'm sure most of you have seen the pictures from amsterdam i think they went viral um, with restaurants in small greenhouses where you can sit two people. You have a restaurant in Sweden in an open field that introduced a one-man table. Um, and, and you have multiple of these innovative new ways of approaching not just the limita limitations, but also taking those new limitations and turning them into a new experience. Drive-in cinemas have seen a new boom, um, concerts and so on. So this is all happening in the midst of this crisis. Now, another thing that I perhaps would say is less innovative is how we see now the return to good old mass campaigning, because now in destinations, and I'm speaking very much from that perspective, um, we're back to that old war of the tourists because we're afraid of the competition. So from a situation during the crisis where we were very much all in it together, now we're realizing, oh, we really need to, once the borders reopen, we need to uh, regain what has been lost. It's very much that tone of voice to all the campaigning happening. And uh, there are two points to that. And I, I say one point is, that there is a, a very similar tone across a lot of this um, campaigning. Um, first of all, because everyone's more or less targeting a domestic or a nearby um, market of travelers. Um, and, and, I, and I think customer insights are now more important than ever, understanding the change of behavior and the motivation to travel and also the fears that will influence that travel. And, and one of those things that we see is staycation. Now, staycation is like the new big thing, but, but I would remind everyone that staycation is not a segment. It's Right now, it's also not really a motivation. It's, it's something that we're just in a situation of, but that staycation will be very, very different for a family who can't go to a resort somewhere and uh, or for a single person who's just out to meet new people. So there are many different motivations. A gastro, a gastronomy interested traveler, an architectural traveler still have that very same motivation or very different motivation drive. But the other thing I would say is that it's also somehow going back a little bit to what or actually a lot of what Juliana was also saying. It's going back to um, the good old days of mass campaigning and also the paradigm of growth. So we're talking very much about regaining what we've lost, but we need to reflect also on what that lost past was. Because over the past couple of years, actually, I've traveled around the world talking about issues of over-tourism and the negative impacts of tourism on local communities and the need to align your tourism development with the local population. And so now, even during the pandemic, you've seen local reactions against tourism. This time caused a lot by fear. I saw uh, an analysis by destination analysts in the US doing a survey of uh, Americans. Uh, they have this weekly survey that they do, and they asked Americans um, how they would feel if they saw travel or destination advertisement for their local community to tourists uh, encouraging them to travel there when it's safe. So not today, but when it's safe. And you have 36.2% of them actually answered that they would be unhappy or very unhappy to see that. So I think when we are now campaigning to regain what has been lost, we need to reflect on that. Because if we don't actually engage with, if we don't work with the local community now, if we don't change the way that we developed tourism before when we ended up in an over-tourism situation, then we will have no credibility in two or three years when we're in the same situation again. And so what I would say is now, uh, in 2017, I was part of the Copenhagen movement that declared the end of tourism as we know it. And at that point, it was very much also a reflection of change that we saw happening. But I would say now we also need to declare it, but we also need to do so by choice, very much going back to what Juliana said. This is a time of change and we need to make that change. We need to reinvent the business model also by necessity because you'll have a limited edition now. You won't be able to earn the same amount of uh, revenue from opening your doors because you won't have the same amount of visitors coming in. So you really have to be innovative, but you also have to understand that you're part of an ecosystem. That's what makes it fantastic to work in tourism, right? We're all part of the same ecosystem, a destination, a city, and we're all dependent on each other. That also goes for the local community. So I'll finish my talk by just showing you this um, one thing, and I'm going to do it as a, my background because that's a lot quicker. Because this is what I really feel that we need to be looking at as well. It's We all know this graph, flatten the curve, but I think we need to look at the tourism version of this. It's not about maximizing a, a, 
tourism and regaining what has been lost past our tourism carrying capacity, we need to identify our tourism carrying capacity, but we also need to, and the sharp uh, viewers will notice that I changed the graph a little bit, we'll need to make it more sustainable over time, make it something that's sustainable for businesses as well, but also for local communities. And with that, I'm going to finish talking for now. Thank you, uh, Zina. Um, when, when we talked to, earlier, you talked about um, it gives a city like York the opportunity to move from quantity to quality. Yes. Can you explain that, what that means? Yes, I think that's what that's what I mean also by reinventing the business model that we need to shift how we see tourism. Tourism is not a goal in itself. Tourism is a resource. It's a means to building our cities and our communities. And that's why we welcome it. That's why we work with it. But that also means that we need to work with it in a way so that it sustains and support the cities that we want to achieve. Uh, that we want to have uh, the communities that the priorities that we have tourism is part of that. And that's why I also mean tourism, working in tourism, we're all part of that ecosystem. You don't travel to somewhere just because there's an empty room with a bed. You travel somewhere because there's something to experience. There's an atmosphere. There are people there. I used to call it localhood, and I still do. And, and I think that's what tourism needs to help sustain. It has to work for us, not separate from us. Thank you, Zina. So let's broaden this discussion further. Our next speaker is Joanna Norris the Chief Executive of Christchurch NZ, the development agency for the New Zealand city of Christchurch. Now, few cities have been through what Christchurch has been through. First, there were the earthquakes of 2011 and 2012, which devastated the city. Then last year came the terrorist attacks in two mosques in the city, which resulted in 51 people being killed. And this year, came COVID-19 and lockdown. But Joanna believes that communities learn and change from crises, and they do recover. Joanna, over to you. Kia ora, good morning. Thank you, Greg. It's so lovely to be joining you uh, all here from my kitchen in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with Christchurch, our city is about as far away from where you are now as it's possible to be while still being on the planet. Um, and I'm sorry that I can't be there with you in person, but it is such a pleasure to be joining this Festival Ideas to be talking about a number of themes uh, that are really common to us all. Uh, it's really interesting listening to Juliana and Zena before me. There is so much commonality to our experiences and uh, to be able to share those in this virtual way is a real pleasure. Um, Christchurch New Zealand is a city, for those of you not familiar, we're about 490,000 people. Uh, we're in the South Island of Aotearoa, New Zealand. It is, of course, the morning here. It's also winter, so we're at the polar opposite um, of, of where many of you are today. When it gets light here later this morning, uh, where I'm sitting, I'll be overlooking the Pacific Ocean, and behind me will be the, the beautiful Southern Alps, um, which is where we love to recreate as Kiwis. Uh, but as Greg said, um, we live in this place of natural beauty and splendour, but we've also suffered great hardship over the past decade. And as a consequence, our cool and compassionate city here in Christchurch, New Zealand, knows a thing about or two about recovery. And many of the themes that you've heard from the previous two speakers are very familiar to us. Um, the, the other thing I just wanted to acknowledge before I really get going is I want to acknowledge the experience that you have all had. These are unprecedented times, and we have watched with horror as COVID-19 has spread across the world, and as countries have struggled to respond to this. We mourn with you, and we acknowledge the pain that communities across the world have suffered. Here in New Zealand, we've worked uh, hard and fast to eradicate COVID-19. Like many of you, we've spent the uh, last many weeks uh, in lockdown in our homes. Uh, I've been working here from my kitchen table uh, alongside my children who we've been homeschooling at the same time. Um, only about 30% of our workforce were deemed to be essential workers and the rest of us needed to work from our homes uh, in order to move hard and fast to eradicate COVID-19. We've been determined as a nation to set that as our goal and we call that our team of 5 million, which is the population that we have here in New Zealand. And our team of 5 million has beaten uh, this terrible disease for now. We've had no new cases here in New Zealand for 11 days, and we've got just one case, one active case left in New Zealand. 
and we're optimistic as a nation that we will eradicate COVID-19. So in the past week, we've been able to return to a semblance of normal life. We've returned to our cafes, to our restaurants, uh, to many of our workplaces. And over the weekend, uh, we had a long weekend, which I think you call a bank holiday weekend, and uh, Kiwis got out and traveled in their droves to many of the places that we love. Uh, but this by no means uh, means that we've escaped unscathed. In order to achieve what is an extraordinary health achievement, our economy, our economy has been badly affected. We shut our borders, which means we've physically locked ourselves from the rest of the world and the distance uh, that we already feel from large parts of the world is amplified. Uh, and this has had a significant impact on our small country. We are hugely reliant on international trade and international tourism. Post COVID, tourism vied with dairy exports to be our number one export earner. And um, it was really interesting hearing Zena uh, speak before me. We too have experienced a number of the impacts of uh, what some people view as over tourism and a number, number of our communities have reacted against that. And we were starting to have pre-COVID uh, a really active conversation as a nation about the social license that is required to support uh, tourism ongoing. So some of those themes about reimagining tourism, rethinking what it means to support the tourism industry are really live for us here. Uh, here in Canterbury alone, tourism provided around 96,000 jobs pre-COVID and much of this was supported by international tourism. And I know um, hearing speakers before me, beautiful York, uh, you have that same impact and I really do feel your pain. Our economists here are forecasting deep recessionary impacts well into next year with negative GDP growth for between 12 and 24 months as a consequence of this. This flows through job losses, business failures, wealth destruction and social impact. So just as we moved fast to deal with the health impact, we're now uh, moving really quickly to deal with the economic and social impacts. And we've been able to move really quickly through, recover, uh, through this recovery journey because, as Greg said, we've been here before. We've suffered a number of tragedies as a community that we've needed to respond with. As uh, Greg said, in 2010 and 2011, we suffered devastating earthquakes here in Christchurch and Canterbury. 185,000 people died in our city. 80% um, of our CBD was destroyed. Tens of thousands of homes were badly damaged or destroyed and thousands of people were displaced. As a consequence of this experience, our economy plummeted. And through this period, we learned a thing or two about recovery. Um, we learned that when a population suffers an enormous shock, such as earthquakes or such as COVID-19, uh, uh, people will cycle through both hope and despair. We learned that very, that very quickly hope can move into despair and then turn into anger, and particularly if promises are made that are not delivered upon. Or if uh, communities are excluded from decision making, or if people are asked their opinion only to be ignored. We also know that cities and regions that are coordinated and have a clear plan for recovery, and I'll avoid using those words roadmap um, out of respect to, to Juliana, but I do want to make the point that when people are organized and communities are organized, they will respond, more, respond and recover more quickly. And we know that as a result of our experiences. So as a consequence of our, both our earthquake experiences and in reaction to the terrible terrorism event that we suffered, we've been very able to very quickly develop a recovery plan to support recovery here in Christchurch. Um, so as we work to recover, to reposition ourselves, we're working through three horizons. And these are horizons that will be familiar to you all. This is becoming a bit of a global lexicon. There's the respond phase, the recover phase, and the reposition phase. During our post-quake years, we described this slightly differently. We called it survive, revive, and thrive. And 10 years on from our earthquakes, we were well and truly starting to thrive. And then of course, COVID took its toll. And, and listening to Greg describe his um, journey in, uh, whilst cheering uh, Make It York, it was really interesting because I can really, really relate to that. Um, in these jobs, we're throwing things that we never truly expect. Uh, but we know that we can do this. I have enormous hope that communities around the world will respond and will respond positively to this. And the reason I have that hope is because we've had this experience and we know that communities do. So in the response phase, we're uh, focusing on the urgent action that we need to undertake to support businesses to survive. In recovery, we're moving from uh, that survival phase to, to growth and starting to think about what our community needs to be different, to, to use Juliana's words, to build back better. 
But whilst we're in those phases, we're also thinking really clearly about the future, about that repositioning phase and focusing on long-term prosperity, intergenerational well-being, economic equality, further development of the Māori economy to support Indigenous New Zealanders reach their ambitions. An activity that ensures that Christchurch and New Zealand are globally competitive, despite the tyranny of distance uh, from you all. And that's about focusing on uh, innovation within a low carbon economy. And we have a really strong commitment as New Zealanders to a long, long term, low carbon economy that is sustainable. So the aspiration is high, uh, and it, but it really does take collective commitment to get there. So we've started to chart the work that needs to happen. And we're able to do that because we've dealt so swiftly with the health impacts of COVID. We're now focusing on buying local, supporting local jobs and local businesses and local manufacturing. We're fast tracking productive infrastructure that helps grow our new economy and gets people back to work very quickly. We're focusing on a labor market transition to take uh, large groups of unemployed, transition them into training and then into new, new industries where we have real growth opportunities. Um, we're really focusing on our city identity and our city brand. And, and as Zena said, this is not about the, the, the business as usual campaigns. This is really starting to think about more carefully, what is our city identity? What is it that binds us? And those are themes of compassion, themes of exploration. These are the things that are in our DNA as uh, the people of Christchurch and uh, as New Zealanders. And then the final piece is really starting to think about building back better, to use Juliana's words. Uh, our smart, sustainable city will have a low carbon economy. Uh, we will support the environment. We are committed to that as Kiwis. We're focusing on future transport, on agri-tech that builds the very best food systems to help support feed Kiwis and uh, feed people in other parts of the world. And we're focused on health technology and green technologies. But we know that we've got a really long way to go because as I say, we've been here before. But we also know that communities around the world will recover. You will all recover. We know that humans are resilient. We know that those that recover fastest are those that are organized and support uh, communities within their local areas and beyond. We know that local and central governments should set the frameworks and then get out of the way. This is about uh, the people in their communities, about the private sector responding. Um, and, and governments should do that all they can to support that, but then make sure that those support systems are there and they're not in the way of the private sector. Uh, and we know that recovery is a chance for a reset and also to acknowledge when things weren't right before. And uh, before I um, hand back over to Greg, the other thing I want to say is the steps that we take now will define our future. We know in our post-quake years, the things we did early on did set us a path for recovery. So coming out of this crisis requires communities to work together for all of us to support each other within our local communities and within our global communities. These are extraordinary times. We have extraordinary communities. I want to share our experience with you and with the world to say you will recover and you will recover more strongly. We will respond, we will recover, we will position, reposition for the future. And I want to end with a Māori proverb, he waka e noa, we are all in this together. Kia ora, thank you. Joanna, thank you. Um... John, thank you. When we when we spoke last week, you said you should never let a crisis go to waste. <laughs> what, what does that mean? Well, I think just reflecting on the themes of the speakers before me, a crisis is an opportunity to actually stop and take stock of the things that are important to you. We certainly learned that in response to the mosque shootings and also the earthquakes, what are the things that are important? And for many people, it was those community connections. It was the creativity that came out of crisis. And it was a chance to actually reset and think about the values that are important to your community. And that's why we are focusing very heavily on growing a low carbon economy. Um, and despite our distance from the rest of the world, making sure we have connections like those that are being formed um, through this festival of ideas. Um, so, you know, it's a, it's a term that politicians use often to make political capital, but it's really one that communities can use to support um, uh, that repositioning or build back better uh, or that, that thrive phase that I talked about. Thank you, Joanna. Uh, I, know, I know it's, we, whenever we speak to anyone from New Zealand, it's always the wrong time, but thanks for giving your time. You're welcome. It's the right time, Greg. Yeah, right. Our full speaker. <laughs> 
is Walter Butcher, who is Head of Research and Economics at Global Property Advisors Colliers International. Based in London, he is keen, a keen proponent of regional development and particularly infrastructure investment in the regions of the UK and as a supporter of the development of York Central. Walter. Thank you very much for the introduction. Well, listen, I'm a bit humbled by my predecessors and the uh, notion of an earthquake taking 150,000 people in a very short space of time, I think puts a lot of this into perspective. Uh, the themes that keep coming up are, are great. They're uh, uh, local engagement, uh, looking for real change, finding USPs, um, mass campaigning, some of the phrases I've heard. And I think this theme of engagement uh, with uh, local population, local stakeholders is really key to, to uh, certainly the recovery in general. Um, so what do I have to say about, I think what's interesting is the COVID impacts are starting to drive what I consider to be coordinated responses across the UK in places where coordination maybe was not yet fully developed. Um, I came off of a call today uh, or webinar uh, from Bristol where um, we were talking about uh, some of the same issues that are that we're talking about today, uh, the, the West of England Combined Authority, which uh, was set up primarily to get stakeholders to work together to create a vision for the for the West of England, uh, establish an economic recovery board, uh, which is comprised of local businesses, uh, universities, um, pretty much all the people that were uh, represented in a Make It York meeting uh, last week that I said in the property group that were talking about the way forward. And, and quite clearly, they were not talking strictly about recovery. They were talking about laying the foundation for taking things to the next stage. And I think that's absolutely essential. And I think that's the theme that keeps coming up um, over and over again. Uh, so in, in the sense that the COVID uh, has come along and has uh, it's been a crisis, uh, it doesn't look to me like uh, York or uh, the West of England local authority so we're, are going to waste it necessarily. If we look down at the, uh, I'm an economist, so I tend to think of so, things, so things uh, fairly structurally. Uh, and I'd say that the initial main impacts that uh, we've obviously seen certainly in New York and other places is uh, that uh, a lot of shops have just shut. You know, I'm a property guy. And one of the things we do is we look at the income streams. And, and I can tell you that uh, if you were to look, say, at the uh, industrial sector, distribution sector, and yeah, most of the rents came in um, for the big stuff over 80 percent. Normally, it'd be about 99 percent, but 80 percent of the rents came in. Um, offices about 65%. Uh, retail uh, shopping centers, 45%, not bad given the headlines that we've seen. Um, when you get down to the high street, it's down to 22%. Uh, and if you get down to leisure, uh, it dwindles rapidly from hotels at about 14%, uh, down to uh, leisure, health and fitness and, and uh, restaurants uh, down at about 8%. Well, look, you can't have an income if you just shut the doors completely as it were. Uh, and I think also that um, what this is doing, too, if you think about the, the structure of this, is that the COVID and the shutdown has basically accentuated trends that were already uh, really in, in development. Uh, if you look at the, uh, the Real Estate Investment Trust share prices, you can see that the industrial operator Seagrow is up. And you can see that anybody with any sort of retail exposure is down really quite considerably, even extremely well-run companies. So I think this story about uh, structural change between uh, retail and e-commerce and all that goes with that has been given a, deci a decisive boost by this COVID. And this presents quite a lot of uh, challenges. I think particularly in a place like York or other places that has a, a huge tourist component. Um, I think you're thinking about uh, replacing pure physical retail now with uh, parts of more mixed use schemes, especially things that include convenience shopping and those things that are non-discretionary spending, food surg surgeries, pharmacies, even last mile deliveries. And of course, um, you know, some sort of leisure facilities too that might integrate in. But above all, I think uh, one of the messages I'm taking away from the property point of view from everything I've seen is that residential um, provision is going to really be driving a lot of this. In fact, in April, um, all our investment agents uh, started pulling their hair out. I've lost mine a while ago, forgive me. Uh, mainly because just the investment transactions dried up, uh, except for, there was a huge amount of investment in what I might call land banking by developers and others 
uh, with the intention of getting uh, residential planning for mixed use schemes right up and down the UK. It was actually really quite phenomenal. Uh, that's about the only thing that didn't, didn't slow down and that's been going on for some considerable period. So I think probably too, when you start thinking about the way through this and the way out of this, um, I think you're gonna have to be through rethinking your, the destination that is York, but integrating it in with these sort of uh, innovative mixed use schemes where there's a lot that becomes possible, whether it's the green agenda, sustainability, and all the rest of it. But when we get to the economic recovery, we've got um, essentially two stages the way I see it. First of all, there's the consumer recovery, which I would include tourism in that, uh, all the stuff that's linked to uh, discretionary spending. And I think the government has gone to really great pains to buy us a little bit of time in order to try to address that in whatever way we can. You know, the furloughing has been extended and the people are definitely taking advantage of it, some in ways they shouldn't, but generally it's, uh, it's working pretty well. And I think we have to use that opportunity to figure out how we open up and how we go about uh, shifting the, uh, the offer so that uh, these things will recover and found, not just recover, but uh, form a new foundation for how we're going to take this uh, uh, forward. That's the first stage of the recovery is the, the consumer thing. Uh, the other part of it though, then, is you get into the uh, second stage of the recovery, which is the region specific sort of industrial um, uh, recovery, the things that, uh, that have uh, been not necessarily shuttered, but slowed down considerably and are in danger or wobbling. Um, the government doesn't want to have to focus on this because that is an even bigger job. And I think the recovery of that is linked more to the duration of this uh, lockdown. And there's already signs now we're starting to loosen it, so maybe we're going to be okay. But I'm thinking about things like uh, out in Bristol, we were thinking about uh, uh, you know aeronautical industry and, and all the rest. In uh, York, I think you're probably thinking about uh, some of the sciences, but also I think tourism is a, is a pretty big focus here. Uh, Opportunities for growth that are coming out of this. I think uh, encouraging mixed use approaches to uh, new projects with housing are something that definitely needs to go forward. Housing itself generates a huge demand. Uh, central government, I got a sneaky suspicion, is going to end up using the house market as a means of recovery. Look, they've done it in the past. You know, if uh, if consumer sales start flagging and the economy starts flagging, you know, you cut stamp duty a bit, you get the market rolling and all the rest. No, you need to hear it here first. But uh, I, I do think that they've got to be thinking about those sorts of things to get the housing market moving again. Uh, but also I think longer term, you have to start thinking too about uh, the remote working. This has been a huge experiment that we've just gone through. And generally the fact that I'm speaking here to over 400 people at the moment, I think is testament to what actually can be achieved. And I think thinking about offices, uh, they're talking now about spoken hub office provisioning to, uh, to allow people to work more at home and uh, commute in more occasionally, uh, taking a lot of stress and also reducing the densities of some of the existing uh, uh, office centers. And I think that plays into the hands of places like York in a, in a very big way. It's a desirable place to live. And it also has pretty good transport uh, uh, links. Um, I, I looked at uh, what uh, the economy of uh, York and uh, I see there's professional and financial services components actually reasonably significant and has been growing. You know, and that's something too that can be uh, uh, developed along with this sort of rethinking about how offices work. Um, then again, there's just providing for large e-commerce provisioning, coffee shops near click and collect points. Uh, there's a hot tip. Um, listen, I stumbled into York and this whole development thing through Sean Bullock and through a fellow named Roddy Morrison who works at our Leeds office and who had an advisory role in some of the early stages of the York Central project. I think, I think that project, for instance, over by the train station ticks an awful lot of boxes. And it's still at a stage where it can be, uh, it offers great scope for innovation and uh, thinking about what the mixed uses should be that takes on board an office component, a residential component, a, a tourist. Kind of, it's, it's, the location is absolutely superb. It's, it's also, though, of a scale that would be of interest to UK institutions and even cross-border investments. It's another big remit of what I do at uh, Colliers is to uh, look at investment opportunities are around uh, the UK, particularly in the regions. That's one of the reasons that, uh, that I'm here tonight is that I just happen to be working the space. But I think too that uh, marketing places uh, like York um, is, is, is a really key theme. And I think probably one of the things that we concluded with in a discussion we had the other day is that, um, I think somebody raised the question, I saw these little questions coming in through the chat and they said, why does the crisis 
uh, why does it require a crisis to get us to work together? I think it's because what happens in a crisis is you have to establish clear, clear leadership. And I think when you get clear leadership, then you're in a position to move a lot of different agendas forward. And when we talk about uh, the opportunities of a crisis, I think that's one of the key ones. Now, if you've got leadership and a collective vision, then you've really got some place to go. Look, I'll stop there and uh, look forward to what you have to say. Thank you very much. Walter, thank you. Um, it, are, do you think some large businesses have discovered they don't need large city centre or large London headquarters, and then that could be an advantage for you? Yes, definitely. I wouldn't say 100% people have come to that conclusions. So uh, there's a very large bank in central London, in the city, city of London, and they were getting ready to, to dispose of some space um, because they were doing a little bit of downsizing, but they had decided to retain the space so that they could keep all their staff in London, but give them a lower density so that they can observe the various uh, new provisions that are going to uh, come in. On the other hand, there's those that have taken a clear view. The insurance sector, for instance, has discovered that uh, they can work remotely without much impact on their business at all. And so a lot of these people are thinking about uh, doing away with the extremely large scale centers, headquarters, and uh, going into a more of a uh, hub and spoke system, which will uh, provide uh, accommodation, office accommodation for workers that are scattered around the UK. So I think that's a big movement. And I just heard today, there was uh, some investors looking at uh, uh, an office park out somewhere around the M25. And it was actually, it was a pretty big uh, ticket item. And uh, on the strength of some advice that uh, one of our uh, colliers uh, actives uh, provided, which was exactly this argument about the hub and spoke system, they bought into it and they said, yeah, that's kind of what we thought. And we would like to start setting up facilities that will cater directly to these people. I, I think that's got a huge distance to, to run. Okay. And I, I, I'm actually quite excited by it. Thank you, Walter. Our fifth speaker is the Vice Chancellor of the University of York, Charlie Jeffrey. Charlie uh, has only been in post for a relatively short period of time, but he has certainly hit the ground running. He believes both York's universities need to play an active part in the development of the city going forward and that the opportunities for a city like York are enormous. Charlie, over to you. Many thanks uh, indeed, Greg. Um, look, it's clear from, from all we've heard so far that we're in uh, an extraordinarily difficult moment. COVID-19 is inflicting deep and damaging effects on our economy and society. We're facing the biggest economic contraction of the modern era. And while some parts of the economy might bounce back quickly, we're likely to see lasting damage, as Walter has just said, in some fields like retail and hospitality. And that damage is set to impact most on occupations with lower levels of skill and productivity, compounding existing patterns of disadvantage. Now, York faces these problems too, as Greg set out starkly in his introduction. How we face these problems is really important. Like Juliana and Senior, I don't think we should be looking back, looking to return to what we understood as normal three months ago, because some of that normal won't come back. We need to look ahead. So is there an opportunity for us to shift our economy into a higher productivity mode that anchors new industries in and around our city. I think there is. And can we do that with a commitment to open up those new industries to disadvantaged groups and places, including those newly disrupted and displaced by COVID-19? Well, I think we have to. Organisations like mine at the University of York can be central to this economic shift by harnessing our R&D our, our, our capabilities and the talents of our graduates to drive economic innovation. But that's not enough in itself. There are two other things that need to be in place. First, we need a collective effort. We need to be more than the sum of our parts. In a city of our scale, we have an inherent advantage. We have short lines of communication. We all know each other. We can build shared purpose more easily than elsewhere. Let's use that advantage. 
Let's engage businesses large and small to collaborate in R&D and to start and scale up new companies. Let's work closely with partners like York St. John University, York College and Ascombe Bryan College to nurture the talent the labour force needs across all skill levels. And let's work with our local authorities to help draw in public and private sector investments. There are two big opportunities for investment at the moment. York Central, Walter was talking about it, by the railway station, one of the biggest brownfield development sites in Europe. And then also the devolution deal process for York and North Yorkshire, in which city and region can join forces to shared benefit. Let's make the most of those opportunities. The second ingredient for economic success is to recognise an asset we can perhaps too easily take for granted. We live and work in a successful, dynamic, extraordinarily attractive place. We need to work with the grain of our place, our city and region, to nurture the best from our economy. Let me set out two areas where we can build on the assets of our place to drive innovation. The first is around the digital economy. We have a growing tech industry in the city, well connected to other hubs in Leeds, London and Edinburgh. The University of York is a national hub for R&D and digital creativity, that interface between new data technologies and the creative arts, which is now driving all manner of innovation in virtual and augmented reality, in computer games, in esports, and much more including, importantly, how we can appreciate and experience our heritage through these new technologies. York St. John and York College bring additional strengths in these fields. What an opportunity for using the extraordinary history of this city, not just as the basis for a visitor economy, but to, an anchor, to anchor an industry with potential applications globally that opens up the appreciation of our heritage through new technologies to new audiences. And as Walter said, what a site York Central would be for a consolidation of these strengths in a major business incubation and development facility that could grow new businesses and attract investment. A second area is around the bioeconomy which is emerging as a key theme in the devolution deal discussion. We have a globally significant innovation cluster here in York, combining the R&D strengths of the University of York in agri-tech, bio-renewables and the circular economy with industrial research at the Food and Environment Research Agency in Sandhutton and land-based innovation and training at Ascombe Bryan College. All of those organizations are developing technologies suited to rural settings. While we have a test bed for the development and application of these technologies in rural North Yorkshire. And we have an industrial context primed to exploit these technologies from the major food chain companies dotted around our region, but also the energy and chemicals clusters to the north on Teesside and to the south towards the Humber. There are a few places in the world that could rival all this. What an opportunity again to build an ecosystem that anchors and develops new industries and new opportunities. And that's not all, because these are all industries set to drive our transition to a low carbon, low waste economy. Can we combine economic growth and at the same time become the UK's first carbon negative region? Well, yes, let's go for it. I think if we build on the assets of our place and bring all of our strengths together, we can transform our economy, we can drive growth, we can speed recovery from the current crisis. But that's only the half of it. Innovation needs to be tied to opportunity. We need new, dynamic, future-oriented industries to be open to those from disadvantaged backgrounds and places and we need them to be open to those whose jobs have been hit by COVID-19. So again, what can we do together to ensure that? Well, plenty. We have all the ingredients to develop and deliver a skills strategy that combines the strengths of our universities, our colleges and our schools in order to open up opportunity, combat disadvantage and ensure that both school leavers and those returning to education and training 
are equipped to drive up productivity and competitiveness in our economy. A few examples. York College leads an institute of technology involving York St John and Ascombe Bryan focused on a STEM skills pipeline from school to college to university and onward to the workplace. Both our universities work collaboratively to open up access to higher education in the smaller towns around York. All four organisations, colleges and universities, have partnerships with companies in the region to develop degree apprenticeships and build new pathways from schools and colleges into university. We can and we should focus this collective capability on our economic strengths. We can be the exemplar of a learning city that builds the workforce skills to feed growth sectors like the bioeconomy, like digital creativity, raising productivity and supporting inward investment. We can target this on the most disadvantaged communities in city and region. We can focus it on reskilling opportunities for those whose roles have been disrupted or made redundant by COVID-19. Or at least we can, if we work together the right way, across institutions, across sectors, driving growth, but also ensuring that the benefits of growth are open to all. University of York emerged from a campaign in this city in the 1940s and 50s, which foresaw a university whose work would, I quote, contribute to the amelioration of human life and conditions. Another way of putting this is that we exist for public good. I think that commitment to public good is shared by partners across the city. Following through on that commitment is, in the current circumstances, more important than ever. Thank you, Greg. Charlie, thank you. Um, what would be your vision for York Central? Uh, my vision for York Central, um, you know, a wonderful multi-use uh, development, but one which is focused above all else on providing the launch pad for the growth uh, of new businesses uh, in, in sectors like the ones I, I've described. Uh, I, I think we could you know, locate lots of, uh, lots of offices there. We could bring in um, you know, extra office workers from other places, but we should really be focusing on the generation of new industries which we can anchor in this city. It's such a brilliant opportunity with that location with that connectivity, north, south, east, uh, and west, it's such a you know one of the best opportunities in the UK by far. Okay, thank you very much. It's now uh, time to open up uh, to questions. The questions have been coming in; uh, they're being fed to me. I'm going to ask the panel. So we're going to bring back the whole panel. Um, just make sure they're all coming. Right, thank you. Here, um, one question particularly about for Joanna. You talked about being a team of five million working towards a shared endeavor. How did you go about achieving a shared vision and a sense of purpose? Yeah, so the New Zealand government were very clear in their communications and kept the message very simple that we had a goal as a nation and it was a goal that was achievable um, because of our um, uh, geographical circumstances, we uh, are an island and we're able to close our borders very quickly. Uh, and then the message was very clear that we're all in this together and we all have a shared commitment. But I think that same simplicity of message can be extended to some of the concepts that Charlie was just speaking of, which is a shared commitment to uh, a new future and um, a shared investment in, in future industry. So it doesn't just need to be about the health response, but also I think it's um, very easy to apply that same type of thinking the economic response also. Yeah, maybe we should ask um, others the same question. Charlie, do you think that you can bring about a shared endeavour in a place like York? I, I, I think we're extraordinarily well placed in a place like York to build shared endeavour. Endeavour, as I said uh, at the start, we're, we're in a we're in a compact place. We we know each other. Um, we have actually wonderful complementarity in, in some of our uh, main institutions. We're not competing with each other. 
I think if you can organize that carefully across those institutions with uh, our local authorities, with our, our business sector, that's extraordinarily powerful. Um, you know, I think I've seen in the chat line uh, as, as we've been going through um, people talking about um, what a shame it is that, that we only develop this sense of community and collective purpose in a crisis. Well, let's not leave it at that. Uh, I think we've seen something special in the last weeks. Let's build on it. Juliana, you're, you're um, part of York. Can you see it happening? Um, this is a festival about being positive. So um, the answer to that is yes. <clears throat> um, being honest, I've seen this uh, try to happen on so many occasions. And uh, despite the fact that there's talk uh, around this panel now about shared interests, um, when you really tug at those and pull at them, um, because uh, something has to happen that might not fit those interests, um, quite often things come apart. And uh, that's why the question that says, um, why do you need a crisis? Well, actually in a crisis, you're more likely to get people to agree to do something that might not be in everybody's best interests, but is actually in the global, as in York, best interests. So um, the answer to that is a bit of no, but oh my God, I hope it's a yes. Greg, Greg if I may, um, we've talked a lot about um, plans and whether you need one or not. And I just really do want to reiterate the value of capturing some of the sentiment that is arising from within your communities now and articulating that in a way that is um, that is clearly understood by your community. And I think there's just, we, we have experienced that time and time again here in Christchurch. If you write it down, give people clear timelines and then work uh, to those timelines in a way that people can see and commit to transparency, um, that can have great value in terms of that shared purpose. Yeah. Do um one other question is these are we're talking about long-term ambitions a lot of the time here and yet we have a short-term crisis uh, can you have both water i suppose that uh, you need to lay the foundations in the course of actually doing the remedial work of trying to uh, pull yourself out of the uh, uh, out of the situation that we're in the crisis that we're in so I guess the idea then is uh, don't do anything that's irreversible, number one. But I'm still, I'm still puzzling, I'm still thinking about this uh, shared vision thing. How do you bring about a shared vision among a very diverse population? Um, and I'm, I'm thinking too that uh, I'm thinking with my property hat on now, uh, the developer hat on. And a lot of this stuff happens in, uh, in uh, the planning process, doesn't it? And uh, forgive me, uh, I'm an American and I come from a place where uh, maybe it's not quite as democratic as it is over <laughs> in the UK generally. And, uh, and it, uh, you could usually get things done pretty well. It's almost as if, uh, and this goes back to the same conversation I had the other day, I was thinking about um, how is it that, uh, that Manchester managed to pull together all the local authorities into a cohesive unit it was done under one individual, uh, Bernstein, over there, who had the leadership qualities and he had the vision. Um, and I, I think that's a repeating theme that comes up. And the question is, is uh, where does that leader uh, come from and, and how does he assemble the vision? And then how do you market it to uh, all the stakeholders? That's, that's the key question. And, and if I had the answer to that, I'd probably be a demagogue or something, but uh, uh, I, I lay it out to the rest of the panel. Uh, any, any ideas? <laughs> any ideas? I think that's why I was saying that you need that person who has that character and that strength. Um, often they come with money, but they definitely come with a strength of character and a personality. Uh, and I met um, the CEO of, uh, of um, or leader of uh, Manchester Council. And when you walked in that room, if he liked the idea, he made it happen. <laughs> and he had a team of people who made it happen for it, for you and made it happen for the city. So, you know, I made a controversial point, which is it's not always the leadership from the, uh, the public sector. Sometimes it is, 
he was an example of that, but I think it has to be the private sector that uh, that steps up and um, demands that this happen. I was just reading a piece earlier that there were proposals for Glasgow to turn one of its streets into a giant greenhouse so that um, cafes and restaurants can spill out onto the streets. Just think how quick and easy and dramatic that is. Just now imagine how many reasons there would be not to do that in York. We need to find that person who can bring the idea and make it happen. I would add, if I could just be between the, if you can have both a long term and a, and a shorter plan or a crisis plan, I think it's, it's really important to have both. I mean, because the long term plan is, is your vision, it's your direction, it's what you're steering towards. But for the shorter term, I think in, in crisis, of course, there's, there's crisis management and, and you need strong leadership throughout that. But it's also, and I think that's part of the energy of the example that you're giving, Juliana, I've also seen that from Vilnius in, in is the innovativeness because no one has this is an unprecedented situation and i heard someone say you know all non-native english speakers just learned that word unprecedented <laughs> because it's been used so much but but i think this is really something new none of us knows what's right none of us have all the solutions and the answers but that also gives us you know kind of a free space to try out different things and and it gives a different flexibility and you've seen that from both public and private bodies and both large and small and 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 so i think that's we need the steering we need the direction and and of course be agile as you go but you need that direction but you also need that space to innovate experiment try out new things There's one can, I, can i add one more little point here i'm thinking with my property hat on now you know all the investment funds uh that have our pensions, you know, the Avivas and the LNGs and all the rest of the, of the world. Uh, increasingly, they are extremely sensitive to the so-called ESG agenda, environmental and social governance. And I think that the COVID uh, episode now has really pushed that agenda well to the fore. And I wouldn't be surprised if there isn't some real innovative thinking going on within those uh, companies and those investment houses that are thinking and looking for projects that would tick all the box. And then suddenly you've got a lot of gravitas behind you in terms of making arguments to uh, to uh, local communities say, look, we could do this, this would be great. You know, it ticks all these boxes. And and in a way you sort of um, divest yourself of the, the direct responsibility by bringing in, um, uh, well, well-intentioned consultants. Is there any such thing? Well, being a consultant, I'd, I'd have to say yes, certainly. But uh, just, a, just a thought that occurred to me. Rick, can I can I say something about about leadership um, while, while we're on that subject? I, I'm not sure we we should be waiting around until we find a heroic leader to uh, to, to take us to to, to to some kind of promised land. Uh, and and you know and, and Manchester had Howard Bernstein; it was brilliant, but it wouldn't have worked without Richard Leese as the political leader. It wouldn't have looked worked without um, two really powerful universities working in different ways for, for economic benefit, uh, a brilliant chamber of commerce and local private sector leadership. It was collaboration uh, across sectors that's been the, the, the foundation of Manchester's success. Uh, and I think we can do that. I, I don't think one person can do it, but I think if we get collaboration across sectors working in the right way, York can be extraordinarily successful and recover from this crisis really, really well. Absolutely agree, Charlie. Organising around the clusters that you've identified in a collaborative way that harnesses the skills, the industry and the community is incredibly powerful and then government enables that. Couldn't agree more. We've had a range of questions in about transport, the green, the green agenda and the rest of it. I've got one long one here, but I will read it. It's quite interesting. There's been lots of discussion about moving forward with the environment and a greener, low carbon economy as a significant focus, which I largely agree with. With regards to transport into the city, how do we achieve this while getting footfall levels back up? I believe one of the speakers mentioned reducing cars in the city as a way of doing this. However, they will likely represent a safer method of travel in a COVID environment than public transport and contribute to increasing footfall numbers in the city. How do we achieve the right balance going forward? Who Craig, I, Craig, I referenced um, the um, Civic Trusts um, document, which I believe was covered by the uh, York Press uh, today. 
Um, I haven't read it in detail. Uh, I was signposted to it. And I think I would say signpost others to it because it was definitely um, written with the purpose of reducing uh, cars and increasing um, pedestrianization in, a, in an organized fashion. That's the long-term goal. There is a short-term goal uh, and, and that's to get people back and to give them confidence to return. So I think, you know, I don't have the magic um, uh, answer to that one at the moment, but I think I was just flagging up, Civic Trust have given it some thought and um, are proposing an idea. But York has always been obvious as a city that you could uh, take the car out of. Why, why has it never happened? Leadership. Is that all? <laughs> it can't just be leadership. That's too easy, isn't it? What do you think? I think, it's, I think it's the most difficult thing in the world to make that. I, I go back that far that I remember the outcry when areas were pedestrianised and the city changed. Um, but I'm also, um, even though I'm a proud Yorkshire lass, I'm also half Dutch. So um, I know what it is to be in a city where the bike um, and the pedestrian come first. And it's a very, very nice place to be. And it's now, and it's what York should be aspiring to. But you need somebody who just makes it happen. Okay. Um... We're getting towards the end of our session. Uh, so I'd like to introduce the, the leader of the City of York Council, Keith Aspiden, the man with the unenviable job of trying to lead York out of this crisis. So Keith, over to you. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Greg. And it's great to be with you all uh, this evening. And before I go on, um, I'd just like to say a big thank you to the University of York for continuing with the York Festival of Ideas, although uh, virtually this year. I can remember uh, last year's at the uh, York Minster, um, and I look forward to, to future years returning to venues like that in, in York. It's been incredibly interesting to, to listen to all the contributions uh, today, and I look forward to future meetings of the, the festival. Um, it's quite tricky to, to, to summarise the, the conversations, and it's always made me panic when the when every panelist starts to talk about leadership um, and what that might mean uh, for the city uh, as, as they point their questions towards uh, me but um I'm not going to talk at great length, but I will highlight some of the aspects of our response in York and our recovery work and, and touch on what a couple of the, the panellists have said. It's actually easy to forget, as it seems so long ago, but before the outbreak um, was declared a pandemic here in York, we were already dealing with the citywide flooding uh, that we saw in February 2020. So very quickly, um, we and, and an awful lot of uh, council staff had to jump from dealing uh, from one emergency event to another. When the lockdown measures were announced on the 23rd of March, our immediate priority was very much to ensure support for vulnerable residents in the city. That's to say those that needed access to food, medicine or those who were isolated. And as a York community, um, we've supported thousands of residents from our nine uh, community hubs. Over 4,000 volunteers signed up with our local volunteering scheme, and they've collectively put in over 23,000 uh, volunteering hours. So a big thank you to them. Um, and that's in addition to national volunteering schemes. Over 2,000 children have continued to be provided with free uh, school meals, and just under 1,000 food parcels have been delivered to residents. But at the same time, we work to deliver support to local businesses, particularly small and independent businesses, we immediately created our own local emergency fund, totaling a million pounds, to assist the micro businesses that we knew did not qualify for government support. And to date, we have paid out over 110 million in grants and relief to over 6,000 local businesses. And I think that gives you a sense of the, the scale of the challenge now and moving forward. Looking forward, we, we must reflect, as, as some of the other panellists have said, on York's history um, to guide our recovery. York's faced significant economic challenges before. Uh, some have been mentioned. Others, for example, the, the changes to the confectionery industry um, and the loss of Terry's Chocolate Factory were, were, were felt in the city. But constant features in, in our history 
our other city's ability to continually reinvent itself um, and utilize our education institutions to retrain the workforce. There are, of course, significant challenges ahead, and these were highlighted by Greg at the very start with the uh, LEPS economic impact study. However, it is really important to repeat that these are predictions and that in York, we should be encouraged by the opportunities we have available to us, opportunities that other cities internationally would relish. We'll continue to work as a member of the West Yorkshire Combined Authority and work is actively taking place on what a devolution, a devolution deal could look like for York and North Yorkshire as demonstrated by Charlie. And with this, there is the potential for significant investment to drive green and inclusive growth. And more uh, details will come clear over June and July uh, about the work that the council leaders across York and North Yorkshire are doing together. We've also secured over 77 million in the recent budget to progress the York Central scheme with the National Railway Museum at its heart, a scheme on the same scale as you've heard as the King's Cross Regeneration Project. And there's no doubt that a project of that size is going to be fundamental to our ability to build back better. Um, and that's where I, I reference Walter's uh, comments on our good transport links and the, the real need to develop mixed use schemes like this. Greg on the, the discussion about the House of Lords and Juliana talking about the, the potential of renewal um, and the, the phrasing there, building back better. In terms of the next steps, we know our, through our experiences of responding to flooding, particularly looking back to the 2015 Boxing Day floods, that we can only overcome these challenges by working with our partners, local residents, businesses, and our communities. And we need to learn from Joanna's input here with um, earthquakes there on working together internationally um, and also how to react with residents to emergency events. The council is developing a short-term one-year recovery plan, and this is going to be presented to a virtual executive meeting later in June as we get used to, to doing things uh, from home. Um, and that plan is going to take a public health approach by ensuring that the health of residents um, and visitors guides any decisions that we take. Um, but to answer one of Greg's questions, I don't think that a short-term plan is enough. Um, so we are also working with our partners, including businesses, on a longer term city recovery plan. And that will very much mirror our pitch uh, for devolution to the government. And this is going to look at the bigger questions, uh, many of which have been really usefully touched on this evening. And I'll, and I'll take many of the thoughts and, and questions away uh, with me, such as how we can use the digital and creative sectors, particularly in York, to drive growth. How can we reach our goal of a zero carbon York by 2030? How we can increase the value of tourism and, and learn from other cities around the world, how we can all benefit uh, from York's successes, how we can harness our city's educational strengths to promote York, but equally, how can we use the spirit and resolve of the community here in York to build back better? We'll soon be launching a citywide consultation on our recovery process, and it's very much going to be an ongoing process, which is currently labelled the big conversation. So I'd urge everybody here to, to keep an eye out for further details and please join in, uh, because as many people have said, um, we do need to work together um, on that process. Um, I'll leave it there, uh, but if anybody does have any questions, please do email me. Um, you'll be able to find my email on york.gov.uk. Uh, and thank you all for listening. And thank you also to, to Greg. Thank you, Keith. Um, I've had one question to everybody else, so I get one to you. Um, and it's one that's come in, actually, which I think is quite good. It says, um, in the new region, the new York and North Yorkshire region, if it happens, do we need a mayor like Manchester, London, Birmingham? So the government has made it absolutely clear. We, uh, most of the council leaders in Yorkshire wanted a one Yorkshire solution. All of the local councils across Yorkshire working together and shouting uh, much more loudly for the North. Uh, the government has made it clear that they want four sub-regional deals, West Yorkshire, uh, East Yorkshire, South Yorkshire, and uh, they've offered us the opportunity in York and North Yorkshire to do it. If you want to unlock the gain share, 
um, which is uh, for us potentially over 30 years, about 750 million pounds, um, you have to accept what is called a Metro Mayor. Um, but what I want to do uh, from July is have a big conversation with residents and businesses in York as to um, is that worth it in terms of the projects that we'd be able to deliver and the economic growth that would be associated with it. So you're not convinced personally? I think that if it means we deliver York Central, we bring about the transport improvements to, to the station, we build Haxby Railway Station, um, then I think you cooperate with the government to, to make progress as a city. It's not the model I would pick, um, but actually it's about looking about what we can do by working together and achieve. Thank you, Keith. Um, we are at, I think, 8.30 and our time is up. Can I thank all our speakers? Can I thank the people who made the technology work, I hope? and to all of you who watched and, and joined in. With respect to next steps, we at Make It York would like this evening's event to form a, a launch pad for a series of smaller, similar discussions focused on the issues faced by York uh, in this new world. And if you would like to participate in any of these, perhaps you can contact us at Make It York. The one thing, the conclusion I draw out of our discussion tonight is that everybody believes that we, we can only fight this and we can only go forward if we get total collaboration right across the city. So let's hope we do. Thank you for coming. Thanks very much.